Welcome back to the 26th episode of Dark Academia Queen. Today we are going to be talking about one of my favorite novelists and short story writers. Can you guess what I'm talking about? If you are guessing the title of this video, then you are correct. On today's episode, we will be discussing the life of Nathaniel Hawthorne and his life. Um... So, you might recognize this from, I'm going to read something, I'm going to read an excerpt and see if you can guess which, where I'm getting this from. Are you ready? The founders of a new colony, whatever the utopia of human virtue and happiness that might originally project, have invariably recognized it among their earliest practical necessities to allot the portion of the virgin soil at the cemetery and another portion of the site of a prison. In accordance with the rule, it may safely be assumed that the forefathers of Boston have built a first prison home somewhere in the vicinity of Cornhill. Almost seasonally, as they marked out of their first burial ground on Isaac Johnson's lot, round about his grave was such subsequently becoming the nucleus of all the congregated sculptures sculptures of the old churchyard of the King Chapel. That is from that excerpt is from the Scarlet Letter, one of my personal favorites. They even did like a sort of a you might recall a movie, um, a while back with um Emma Stone in it a while back, um, Easy A, where they kinda of like a simul resemblance of that in somewhat. Um really funny. I do recommend going and watch it by the way. But Nathaniel Hawthorne was an American novelist and short story writer. His works focused on history, morality, and religion. He was born in Salem, Massachusetts. Hint, hint. That's going to be my our next episode. We're going to do a two-episode part on the history, haunted history of Salem, Massachusetts. In our next epi two episodes. So, tune in for that. Um, but anyway, he went to Bolden College in 1821 and was elected Pi Beta Kappa in 1824. Um, and graduated in 1825, and he first pu he published his first work in 1828, and which was later suppressed um, to to it not feeling equal to stand up to his later work. He also published several short stories, periodical, in which he collected in 1837 as Twice Told Tales. That following year, he would get engaged to Sophia Peabody. He would work at Boston. He worked at Boston Custom House in Drawing Brook Farm before marrying Sophia in 1842. The couple would also move to the old man's in, to to old, the old man's in Concord, then to Salem, then to Berkshire, and then to the wayside in Concord. And the Scarlet Letter was published in 1850, following followed by a succession of other novels. A political appointment as consul took um, Hawthorne and his family to Europe before they were returned to Concord in 1860. He would die May 19th, 1864. Um, now, much of his writings center on New England. Many of his works feature moral metaphors with the anti-Puritan inspiration. His fiction work is also considered part of the Romantic movement. Um... And his themes often center on the inherent evil of sin of humanity. And his works often have moral messages to keep it to keep to a deep psychological complexity. He published his his published works include novels, short stories, and a biography of his friend, co college friend Franklin Pierce. Um, written for his 1852 campaign for the president of the U.S., in which Pierce won becoming the 14th president. Now, let, let's get into some of his biography. Like, what was what was his life like? Well, he, as his name was originally spelled, so he was born July 4th, 1804. So, and in Salem, Massachusetts, in the birthplace that preserved. That, that is preserved and open to the public. His great grandfather, William Hawthorne, was a Puritan and also the first in his family to immigrate to, from England. 
He settled in Dorchester, Massachusetts before moving to Salem. Then, there he became a member of, of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and held many p political positions, including magistrate and judge, becoming infamous for his harsh sentences. Um, William's son, um, Hawthorne's great-great-grandfather, John Hawthorne, was one of the judges who oversaw Salem Witch Trials, and Hawthorne probably awarded the W to his surname in his early 20s, shortly after graduating from college, in an effort to disassociate himself from his notorious forebears. Hawthorne's father, Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, Sr., was a sea captain who died in 1808 of yellow fever in the Dutch surname, and he had a member of the East India Marine Society. After his death, his widow moved a young Nathaniel, his oldest sister Elizabeth, and his youngest sister Louisa to live with relatives named the Mannings in Salem, where they lived for 10 years, and young Hawthorne was hit on the leg while playing bat and ball on November 10th, 1813, and he became um, lame and bedridden for a year, though several physicians could not figure out what was wrong with him. What was his childhood like in Raymond? Well, in the summer of 1816, his family were, lived in borders with farmers before moving to a home recently built specifically for the, by them for, them, for Hawthorne's uncles Richard and Robert Manning in Raymond, Maine near Sebago Lake, and years later, he looked back at his time in Maine fondly. In 1819, he was sent back to Salem for school and soon complained of the homesickness of being too far from his mom and sisters. He disturbed seven distributed seven issues of the spectacular to his family in August and September of 1820 for fun. The homemade newspapers was written by hand and included essays, poems, and news of featuring the young author's Alice's humor. Now, Nathaniel's uncle, Robert Manning, insisted that he attend college, and despite his protest, he did. With the financial support of his uncle, he was sent to Baldwin College in 1821, partly because of the family connections in the area, and also because it was rel relatively inexpensive as far as tuition went. What's inexpensive? Okay, what is inexpensive tuition? Let me know. That would be nice right there. Uh, what well, I would give to have my tuition paid for, paid in full. That would be lovely. But Nathaniel met his future president, met future president Franklin Pierce there, on the way there, and at the stage stop in Portland, and the two became fast friends. Once in school, he also met future poet Henry Wadsworth Longfeller. Future Congressman John Hanseley and future naval reformer Horatio Bridge. He graduated from with the with the class of 1825 and was described later. Described his college experience to Richard Henry Stoddard. He that he was an idle student, um, neg negligent of college rules and prescrocian details of his academic life and choosing to nurse his own fancy. And digging into Greek and numbered many um, among the Lauren cabins. Now, Boston College House. Um, now, he's, his first published work was Franshaw, um, a tale based on his experience at Boston College and appeared anonymously in October 1828, printed at his own expense of $100. I'm pretty sure that was a lot back then, too. Although it was received generally positive reviews, it didn't do sell well, and he published several minus pieces in the Salem Gazette. In 1836, he served as the editor for the American Magazine of Useful Entertaining Knowledge. At the time, he boarded with poet Thomas Green Fastenen on Hancock Street and Beacon Hill in Boston. He was offered an appointment as Regner and Gogger. Gozier at Boston Custom House at a salary of fifteen hundred a year. That that must have been a pretty no, is that like a pretty decent amount then? I am curious on that. Like nowadays you could even you can't even make that much make it off that much in today's economy. But anyway, he accepted this job on January seventeenth, nineteen eighteen thirty nine. 
And during his time there, he would rent a room from George Stillman Hillard, who was a business partner of Charles Somner. Nathaniel wrote in a comparison, comparative obscurity of what he called Owl's Nest in the family home as he looked back on this period of this, his life. He also contributed short stories to various magazines and annual inclu annuals, including Young Goodman Brown and The Minister's Black Veil, which drew more attention to him, and Horatio Bridge offered to cover the risk of collecting these stories in the spring of 1837 to a volume twice told tales, which made Hawthorne known locally. Now, I mentioned earlier that he he did marry Sophia Peabody. Um, he had various, but he also had various flirtations with Mary Silphy and Elizabeth Peabody, and then he began pursuing Peabody's sister. The illustrator and transcendentalist um, Sophia Peabody, he joined the San transcendental dentalist utopian community in Brook Form in 1841, not because he agreed with the experiment, but because it helped him save money in the in Mary Sophia. Sorry, guys, I got sidetracked for a second. Um, but he would pay a thousand dollars deposit and was in charge of shoveling the hill in manu manure referred to as the gold mine. He left later that year. Though, th though his book form eventually became an inspiration for his novel, The Blatterate Romance, he also he would marry Sophia July 9, 1842, at a ceremony, at the ceremony um, in the Peabody, Peabody Parlor on West Street in Boston. Um, the couple were moved to the old man's house in Concord, um, where they lived for three years, and their neighbor, his neighbor, can you guess who I'm talking about? Can you guess? Can you guess? I just did an episode on him, and actually, you can go back to the episode before this one, because it's Ralph Waldo Emerson. Yes! So many connections right here, like, this is perfect how it conveniently all planned out. Not intentional, it just worked out that way. But um, Emerson invited him to a social circle, but Hawthorne was also path pathologically shy and stayed silent at gatherings. Introvert, I know that feeling, trust me. I'm the one, if I go ever get go out to a social setting, I'm going to find a corner with a book, or if there's an animal, guess where I'm going? I'm going to be seeing, I'm going to be talking to the, playing with the animal the whole time. Don't judge. Don't. We all know this. But it was at Old Main that he wrote um, most of his tales collected in, mo in mosses from an old manse. And like Hawthorne, Sophia was a reclusive person. Throughout her early life, she had frequent migraines and underwent several experimental medical treatments. And she was mostly forbidden <coughs> bedridden until her sister introduced her to Hawthorne. After which her headaches seemed to have abated. And the Hawthorns enjoyed a long and happy marriage. He referred to her as his dove and wrote and wrote that she is, the, in his strictest sense, my sole companion and that I have no other. There is no vacancy in my mind and many more in my heart. Thank God I suffered for my boundless heart. Oh, that makes me happy, happy cry on that. Um, but Sophia did admire her husband's work. So poet Ellery Channing came to Old Man's to help on the first anniversary of Hawthorne's marriage, and a local teenager named Martha Hunt had drowned, drowned herself in the river, and Hawthorne's boat pond literally was needed to find her body. Hawthorne helped recover the course, in which he described as a spectacle of such perfect horror. She, um, she was the very image of a death agony. Weird, but I think I kind of like it. Does that make me weird? Um, but anyway, the incident later inspired a scene in the novel, The Blithdale Romance. Now, the Hawthorns had three children. The first was Una, who was born March 3rd, 1844. Her name was in reference to the Fairy Queen, to the displeasure of family members. Um, in October in October 1845, the Hawthorns moved to Salem. Their son Julian was born, and then they had, and then Hawthorne wrote to his sister Louisa on June 22nd, 
1846, saying a small troglodyte made his appearance here ten, at 10 minutes at 6 o'clock in the morning, who claimed to be your nephew. Then they would have a daughter, Rose, in May of 1851, and Hawthorne called her his autumnal flower. Can you imagine these kids were like, really, Dad, just rolling their eyes and all of that and everything, so, like, whenever he would make assertions like this? But, anyway. In April of 1846, Hawthorne was officially appointed the surveyor of the District of Salem in Beverly and inspector of revenue for the Port of Salem of his annual salary of $1,200. He had difficulty writing during this period and was admitted to Longfellow. This appointment, this appointment, like his earlier appointment to the Customs House in Boston, was vulnerable to politics and spoil system. He was a Democrat and lost his job due to the change in the administration in Washington. After a presidential election in 1848, he wrote a letter to protest the Boston Daily Advertiser, which was attacked by Whigs and supported by the Democrats, making Nathaniel dismissal a much talked about an event in New, New England. He was only deeply affected by the death of his mom. No, he was deeply affected by the death of his mom in late July, calling it the darkest hour he ever lived. I have a feeling he was a very he was a very dramatic person. Looking back now, like think about it, he was probably very dramatic. If I had to guess, uh, imagine his kids though. They're like, okay, dad, this is sad, but come on. But anyway, I can only imagine that. But anyway. He was appointed to the corresponding secretary. He was appointed as the corresponding secretary of the Salem Lyceum in 1848. And guess who came to that season was Emerson Thoreau, Louis uh, Gasses, and Theodore Parker. He returned to writing and published guess 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 the Scarlet Writer in mid 1850s. 1850, including a preface. Um, that refers to his three-year three year tenure in the Custom House and makes several allusions to local politicians who did not appreciate their tr their treatment. And it was once one of the first mass-produced books in America, selling 2,500 volumes within 10 days and earning him over $1,500 14, over 14 years. The book was pirated by bestsellers in London and became a bestseller in the U.S. and initiated the most lucrative period his most lucrative period as a writer. His friend Edwin Percy Whippy objected to the novel's morbid intensity and extensive psychological details, writing that the book is therefore apt to become like Hawthorne, too painfully anatomical in his exhi exhibition of them. While the 20th century writer D.H. Lawrence said that there could be no more perfect work of American imagination than the Scarlet Letter. Now, Hawthorne and his family moved to a small wet farmhouse near Lenox, Massachusetts at the end of 1850, and he became friends with Harmon Melville. Beginning on August 5, 1850, where the authors met in a picnic and hosted by a mutual friend, Melville had a real Hawthorne short story collection, Mosses from an Old Manse, and his unsigned review of the collection was printed in Literary World on August 17th and August 24th, titled Hawthorne and His Mosses. Melville uh, wrote that these stories um, revealed a dark side to Hawthorne. He was composing his novel Poby Dick, Moby, <laughs> Moby Dick at the time and dedicated his work to, in 1851 to Hawthorne. Um, now, Hawthorne's time in, in Brooks House was very productive. While there, he wrote The House of the Seven Gables. Um, which poet and critic James Russell Lovell, Lowell said was better than the Scarlet Letter and called the most valuable contribution in New England history ever made. He also wrote the Blithdale Romance, his only, his only work written in first person, by the way. Um, he also wrote A Wonder for Girls and Boys in 1851, a collection of short stories retelling myths that have been thinking about writing since 1846. Nevertheless, Poet Ellery Channing reported that Hawthorne has suffered um, much losing in his place. Wait, here's my question. 
was Hawthorne and Torture Toy after all? Um, after all, just saying. Torture Poets Department. Okay, there's my Taylor Swift reference. I can't promise that's gonna be my last one. But the family had a seen enjoyed the scenery at Birch House, and although the Hawthorns did not enjoy the renters in their small house, they left November twenty fourth, eighteen fifty one. Now, let's talk about their time at the Wayside in Europe. In May 1852, the Hawthorns return, returned to Concord, where they lived until July 1853. In February, they bought a house in the hillside, a home previously inhabited by Amos Broughton Branson Alcock. Why does Alcock sound so familiar? I know why that last name sounds familiar. wonder if there's any relation. Pay close attention to that and remember that for future episodes. Now... And his family, they reclaimed the wayside, and the neighbors of Concord, including Emerson, Henry David, Henry David Thoreau, and that year Hawthorne wrote The Life of Franklin Pierce, the campaign biography of his friend in which he was depicted as a man of peaceful pursuit. Now, with Pierce's election as president, Hawthorne was rewarded in 1853 with the position of the U.S. Consul in Liverpool shortly after the publication of the Tanglewood Tales. Um, and the role was considered to be the most lucrative foreign, ser foreign service position at the time, described as Hawthorne's wife as a, by Hawthorne's wife as a second indignity to the em embassy in London. And during this period, he and his family lived in the Rock in the Rock Park Estate in the Rock Ferry, as one of the houses adjacent to Tamir Beach, on the rival shore of River Mercy. Thus, to thus to attend his place of employment at the U.S. Consulate in Liverpool. Now, Hawthorne would have been a regular passenger on the steamboat operated by Rock Ferry to Liverpool Ferry service, departing from Rock Ferry Slipway. At the end of Bedford Road. His appointment ended in 1857 in the close, at the close of Pierce's administration. The Hawthorne family toured France and Italy until 1860. And during the time in this time in Italy, a previous clean-shaven Hawthorne grew a bushy mustache. Um, the family returned to the wayside in 1860, and in that year, they saw the publication of Marvel Fawn. The first new book in seven years, and he admitted that he aged considerably, referring to the book as a wrinkle time and trouble. So, what about his later years? Um, at the outset of the American Civil War, he traveled with William D. Tickner to Washington, D.C., where he met Lincoln and other notable figures. He also wrote about his experiences in the essays, chiefly about, about war matters in 1862. Now, Falling health prevented him. Falling health, yeah, failing health prevented him from completing several more romance novels. Um, he was suffering from pain in his stomach and insisted on a recuperate recuperated trip with his friend Franklin Pierce. And through his neighbors, Branson Adcock, he was concerned about a Hawthorne and was too ill. While on tour at the White Mountains, he died in his sleep, May nineteenth, eighteen sixty four, in Plymouth, New Hampshire. Pierce sent a telegram to Elizabeth Peabody asking her to inform Mrs. Hawthorne in person. Sophia was so saddened by the news um, to handle the funeral arrangements herself. Her son Julian was a freshman at Harvard College and learned of his father's death the next day. Coincidentally, he was initiated into Delta Kappa Epsilon fraternity on the same day by being blindfolded and placed into a coffin. Irony, if you call it like that. But Longfellow would write a tribute poem to Hawthorne, published in 1866, called The Bells of Land. In which, um, I'm going to read it, it goes... O curfew of the setting sun, O bells of land, O wicrium of the dying day, O bells of land, from the dark death reads yon cloud collateral, 
ca cathedral rafted, ye sound aerial seem to float, O bells of wind. Born on the evening in the winds across the crimson twilight, O earth, the land and sea, they rise and fall, O bells of wind. The fisherman in his boat, far out and beyond headland, listen and leisurely on rows ashore, O bells of wind. Over the shining sands and the wandering cattle home, follow each of each other at your call, O bells of wind. The distant lighthouse hears and, with his flaming signal, answers you passing in the watchwood on, O bells of wind. And down the darkening coast, um, coast runs the tormentous um surges. And clap their lit hands and shout to you, O bells of wind. Till from the shuddering sea, with your wild and incantations, you summon up the spectral moon, O bells of wind, and startled at the sight, like the well weird woman of Ender, ye cry aloud and then are still, O bells of wind. Now, Hawthorne was buried. On what is now known as Ofter's Ridge and Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord. The pallbearers would include Longfellow, um, Alcock Emerson, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., James T. Fields, and Edwin Percy Whip Ripple. Emerson would write of the funeral as I thought there was a tragic element in the event that night being m fully rendered as the painful solitude of a man in which I suppose can no longer be endured during he died of it. Now his wife Sophia and daughters Una were originally buried in England. However, in June 2006, they were re-interred re in the plots adjacent to Hawthorne. Now what about his writings? Well, statues of his writings are in Salem by um, Bella Lyon Pratt and is dedicated in, in 1925 to William H. Glashtel. The 1861 photograph of Hawthorne was inspired to the sculpture. Now, Hawthorne had a particular close relationship with publishers William Pickner and James T. Field. And Hawthorne once told friends um, that I care for you for your good opinion than uh, a host of critics. In fact, it was Fields who convinced him to um, turn the Scarlet Letter into a novel rather than a short story, and he handled many of Hawthorne's personal writings, including the person personal matters, including the purchase of cigars, overseeing financial accounts, and even purchasing clothes. Tickner would die with Hawthorne at his side in Philadelphia in 1964, and according to Hawthorne. A friend, Hawthorne was left apparently dazed. Let's talk about his literary styles and themes. His work belongs to Romanticism, or more specifically, Dark Romanticism. Cautionary tales suggest of guilt, sin, and evil of the most inherent natural qualities of humanity. Many of his works are inspired by Puritan um, New England. Combining historical romance loaded with symbolism and his depictions of the past are versions of historical fiction used only as a vehicle to express common themes of ancestral sin, guilt, and retribution. His later works also reflected negative views of the transcendentalism movement. And it was predominantly a short story about his early career. Upon publishing in Twice Told Cell, Tales, he noted that I do not think much of them and expected little response from the public. His four major romances were written between 1850 and 1860. And this includes The Scarlet Letter, The House of the Seven Gables, The Blithdale Romance, and The Marvel Fond. Another novel length, uh, Fonchar, was published anonymously in 1828. Hawthorne defined a romance as being radically different from a novel by not being by not being concerned with a possible a probable course of ordinary experiences. In the pre in the preface of the House of the Seven Gables, 
Hawthorne describes his um, romance writing as using atmospherical medium to bring out a mellow of the light that deepens and to enrich the shadows of the picture. Now, critics have applied feminist perspectives and historicist approach to his this depictions of women. And here's the thing: you've got to remember at this time, women were not considered people; they were considered property. Um, but Lauren um, Berlin termed Hester um, the citizen of a woman. But there were many people who criticized him a lot of times, but he always he will all forever be one of my favorite um authors. Now, there is some critical reception. His writings were well received at the time. Contemporary response praised the sentimental and the morally the moral purity and the modern evaluations that focused on the dark psychological complexity. Norman Melville wrote a passionate review of Mosses of the Old Man's title, Hawthorne and His Mosses, arguing that it is one of the new and far better generation of writers. He also describes the infinity of Hawthorne that would, that would only increase. Melville also wrote important reviews of both the twice-told novels and Mosses from the Old Man's. As well, and I actually talked about Poe in the first episode, so you can go and check that out as well if you are like. Now, what are some of his selected works? Well, Nemias Smith from A Wonder Book of Boys and Girls, um, and according to Hawthorne scholar Rita K. Collin was the definitive, the definitive edition, definitive edition of Hawthorne's work of is. The sanitary sanitary edition of the works of Nathaniel Hawthorne. Alright, that is it um, for this episode. I will see y'all next time. Y'all have a great day as we talk about haunted history of Salem, Massachusetts.